Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Pediatric Grand Room. It is. Hi. Welcome to our applicants. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. James Thompson from the Department of Surgery. Dr. Thompson trained at the University of Mississippi and completed his surgical and plastic surgery training at Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center with additional training in craniofacial surgery in Adelaide, Australia. He currently serves as an Associate Professor of Surgery at VTC SOM, Associate Director of the Plastic Surgery Residency Program, and the Director of the Clefton Craniofacial Center here at Corillian. He has numerous publications and presentations nationally and internationally, and his current area of research includes analysis of cranial-based fusion pattern. Please welcome Dr. Thompson. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. That way I don't knock it off. So, I, I, as you heard, I, my, my main interest and in the thing that I've talked to this group before about is the cranial facial clinic, but I'm here today to talk about pediatric burns. Um, and although I'm, I'm not a burn surgeon per se, uh, I, I spent the, when I was at Wake Forest on faculty, I spent about 10 years as sort of a member of the burn team taking care of pediatric, mostly hand and face burns. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit of that with, experience with you and to try to, try to talk about, you, you know, I was trying to gear this talk towards what, what you would do if a burn patient came in to see you in your clinic or perhaps you were, uh, you know, caring for somebody uh, on the floor or something like that. And, and so we'll talk about things that you should know and I'm not planning to spend a whole lot of time to talk about the surgery side of it, um, so I apologize to any of the surgery residents that may be here. But um, no disclosures. So um, some goals and objectives which we'll talk about. We'll, we'll cover all these things. So uh, as you might imagine, burn injuries are quite common. And so um, if, if you just look nationwide, and, and these numbers are super hard to really calculate because we don't really know exactly how many people are burned and don't really seek care. Um, but about 25,000 pediatric admissions annually and 750 roughly deaths per year for burn injuries. Um, and the sad truth is most of those are probably preventable. But the, uh, the, the, the consequences, even if you survive, can actually be quite challenging. And that's one of the issues that we certainly deal with on the plastic surgery side. Uh, it are the long-term problems, and I'll, I'll mention it sort of at the end of the talk, but some of the things that, that we do, but, you know, we're talking about the person that's healed, but then it has a lifetime of scar-related problems that we are dealing with and trying to, you know, maximize function and form as much as we can. Um, so looking uh, further into some of the details of this, there's a study out of uh, Dallas where they looked at 5,000 pediatric patients, and you know, so this is over a 35-year period uh, that were admitted for the, to the burn center there. Um, a little bit more male than female, and the majority of these were scald injuries, or the single largest section were scald injuries, followed by flame and contact. Uh, not surprisingly, a substantial portion of these burns, uh, or really more than half of them, occur in toddlers, for obvious reasons if you've had a toddler. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, overall mortality is around two and a half percent. So that that really, you know, uh, obviously there are factors that will that will go into why that is. And so when we when we kind of drill into that, we find that uh, unfortunately abuse is a, a major risk factor for mortality from burns. That actually doubles the mortality. Um, and the, t the the total body surface area of the burn is another one that is a, a big deal. So anytime you've ever seen somebody talk about burns, or you you always you know if you, if you forget on the ITD-10 to pick your code for a patient who had a burn is like a million different options, um, but they involve these percentages, and, and part of the reason for that is that we know those percentages correlate to outcome, and so there's a real break point at about 30 percent uh, where mortality really skyrockets, and so in that, there, there are things, of course, that go into that, uh, uh, the age of the patient and the overall health, of course, you know, uh, combine to make that mortality even higher. Um, if you look at cases where people have died, uh, it, the average uh, percent burn is 60%. Inhalation injury is another thing that is highly associated with mortality, and we'll talk a, a bit more about that uh, later. Um, and then the cause of death is typically sepsis. That's the most common cause. Multi-organ failure and oxygen injury also play into that. But uh, it, 
you know, the, the problem that we burn patients run into is that most people don't really think of the skin as an organ system, but it plays an incredibly important function when intact skin is, is protecting you against the world, and when you don't have it, you're at high risk for infection. And so that is one of the things that has always been a problem in burn care is sorting out how do we, how do we avoid that and what, and what things can we do to, to, you know, to prevent it, and, and we'll, we'll talk some of that about that too. Um, I'm going to mostly focus on thermal burns. There are, of course, chemical burns uh, as well, and they're just much more rare. And so I really just kind of wanted to focus in on the thermal tie because that's mostly what you're going to see. Um, there are some particular things that you do for particular chemicals, uh, but uh, I just really wanted to kind of simplify the talk so we could kind of get through everything that I feel like would be use useful to say. Um, so it's all about temperature and time. And, you know, so one of the things that, um, you, you know, you, you have to realize is that if you touch something hot, you don't, just because it's hot enough to burn you doesn't necessarily mean you will get a burn. It's all about how hot it is and how long you touch it. And so you can see from the little chart that it's not just a linear curve either. What happens is as the temperature gets hotter, the amount of time that you, that you touch it that, that results in a burn gets worse. And so the, uh, I highlighted the six seconds at 140 degrees because that is a, a, a common setting for house hot water heaters. Um, and so as you can see, you know, it doesn't take long to be exposed to that temperature to get a, to get a scald burn. But even at lower temperatures, there, you know, it, even at 130 degrees, uh, 30 seconds can do it. Now if you think about it, if the water comes out of the faucet at 130 degrees, 30 seconds later it's probably less than that and so forth, but still, you know, it's, it's something to consider and I'm sure many of you would recommend that water heaters be set less, to less than 140. Which, of course, brings the question as to why are they set to 140 anyway, right? And so, unfortunately, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Uh, if you put hot water in a tank and just keep it there at 115 degrees or so, it'll grow bacteria. And so keeping your hot water heater at 140 degrees is a known way to reduce bacterial growth, particularly Legionella. So uh, it, there's actually different, there's different competing recommendations. OSHA reckons 140. Uh, and uh, other organizations will recommend 120. Uh, I, I think that you know it's probably smart in a household of small children to recommend uh, either 120 or a you can have a regulator put on that will actually blend cold water in with the hot water so the tank sits at 140, but the the, the water actually comes out at, at less than 130. So there are ways to do that. You know, I, and once again, now you're talking about equipment expense and getting a plumber out and so forth, but um, that's the that's just one way to, to sort of handle that. We keep our uh, our uh, water heater at 120 because I, I have little children; they're getting bigger now. But um, you know, it's just something to consider. Um, other thing that I think is worth mentioning to understand about burn injury is that when you, when you get a thermal injury, you have these zones of injury, and this, this often comes up in you know like basic science reading and whatever, but it actually plays an important part because it, it, it shows that what we do next makes a difference to the outcome of the patient. So you, basically the idea is that you have a, the place that is the worst, and this is, we're not talking about a first degree burn here, we're talking about a you know, deep second or third degree burn. So the place that's the worst is called the zone of coagulation. That'll be in the middle, that's with the portion of the skin that was exposed to the longest and had the highest temperature. That skin is basically gonna be dead and there's not anything you're gonna do about it. There's nothing you can do to save that. Then you have this zone of stasis that's a, a ring around that, and then the zone of hyperemia is a ring around that. And so it's really the zone of stasis that's the effort uh, zone. That's, that's what we're trying to put our effort into because we know that if we properly resuscitate and treat these patients, we can keep that skin from dying. And so that's what the little, little pictogram is showing at the bottom there, that you know a well-resuscitated patient gets a smaller area of scar because they have the, the overall amount of skin was less than what happened if they had uh, inadequate resuscitation. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we, we kind of break down seeing these patients and treating them. And so we'll, 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 we'll focus, focus mostly on phase one, which is just what happens when the patient first appears and what are you going to do about it? And, and, and you know, how, what will be your decision-making tree in terms of do I treat this patient as an outpatient? Do I, you know, send them to the hospital? Um, you know, so 
we'll talk about that, initial care, what you, what, what you would initially do, how you assess the burn, and then what that disposition uh, might be. Uh, you know, and so, so the truth is, there's a lot of burns that if you actually read, and we'll, we'll go over this, if you read the burn ABA criteria for transfer to a burn center, a lot of those burns can be managed in an outpatient. And that's very confusing, and so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, anyway, that's one of the things I want to kind of go over is, is, is what you do. So obviously if somebody rolls into the, to the ER or to your clinic with, with a burn injury, you've got to remove clothing and jewelry. Um, the, the jewelry part often gets overlooked, but you have to remember that things are swelling, and so rings and bracelets and things like that can become actually constrictive bands uh, as things swell up. So definitely make sure you get those things off as soon as you can. And um, obviously you need to remove the clothing to really determine what type of burn there is. Sometimes the clothing is badly burned and the skin is fine. So it, you definitely need to, to get a good exam of thing. If it's very early on, if the person really was just burned, this is really going to be more like something where you have a friend that was injured and you were standing right there, cooling the burn right away actually can be helpful because you can actually prevent some of that injury if you're right there and you cool the burn immediately. Um, beyond that, there's probably not a whole lot of value in that. So, you know, once, once you've got where this, it was 30 minutes or an hour or more ago, you know, the damage is done, the temperature is, uh, of the skin has returned to normal, uh, cooling it may be soothing, but it, it's not necessarily going to change the burn. Um, and you have to consider in a larger burn that you don't want to cause hypothermia by, you know, placing a cold dressing on a patient or something like that. Um, in the very beginning, what we generally want is to not put any kind of ointments or creams on it. Um, if, if this is a patient that you're considering transferring to the ER and you want someone to evaluate this burn, you don't want to slather it up with ointments or creams and things like that. It's just, we'll just have to scrape all that off, you know. So what you really want to do is just, you can just get like a moist gauze and just kind of wrap uh, the extremity or whatever part is burned, just kind of keep it covered. Um, that helps to kind of, you know, keep some, some of the moisture in and, and it's just, it's, burned skin is uncomfortable to the air, so that's just a comfort issue. And that way it's easy for us to then evaluate, you know, uh, what the burn looks like. So the next thing that we do uh, when, when we're evaluating a burn is, is sort out what degree of depth it is. And so everybody knows these kind of basic degrees, um, but it's still surprising to me how often it's, it's a challenge to sort out one from the other. Um, so obviously a first degree burn is like a sunburn. This, this is the burn where the, the skin is dry, it is intact. You can put your finger on it and it blanches. You know, it is, it is a classic sunburn look. Now everybody knows that sunburns can peel. That does not make it a second degree burn because it can potentially go on to peel. It is still just a first degree burn if at the time of the burn, the skin is intact and, you know, and dry and warm and just, you, you can, and it's sensei, it's usually tender and all that. So that, that's a, the classic example of a, uh, of a first degree burn. Second degree burns are going to cause the skin to break. And so that could actually show up in the form of a blister, like you see on, the, on that toe there, or, or the skin could totally fluff off, as we see on that, that leg. Um, so, you know, so these are a little trickier. I mean, obviously it's easier to, you know, when, like, and when you look at this, this patient's foot, that there, there are actually areas of first degree burn as you move up the foot a little bit. The second degree burn is the blister. Um, and so, you know, sometimes it's a little tricky to, to differentiate deep second degree from third degree. Um, and, and the truth is, is that e even, even in the world of burn surgery, that's not always 100% uh, obvious. So uh, you don't have to worry so much about that. It, it, the most important thing is to be able to differentiate second from first. Um, and, and there's reasons for that. So anyway, so that's a, a classic example of second degree burns where the you know, typically what you would find is either a blister over the skin and if, you know, and if you were really worried that perhaps the burn was very severe and you wanted to know more about the depth, you would unroof the blister and look at the burn skin below it. Um, uh, and, and we'll talk a little bit in a minute about what to do about blisters. But the, um, the, the leg that you see there is, is a pretty classic second degree. So what we're looking at there is an area of moist skin uh, with you know, some areas that are bleeding, and it's usually, if, for a burn like this, if you were to touch this, it would be painful. Uh, that is, those are all classic signs of a second degree burn. So the top layer of the epidermis has been burned away and is fluffed off, but the deeper layer of dermis are still intact. So the nerve endings are intact, and um, so that, that's just what you'd expect to find in a second degree. With third degree, what happens is that you get Sometimes the actual, the, the full thickness layer of skin just becomes like a patch of leather. So when you touch it, it feels actually dry, 
and it, it can be a little bit confusing sometimes because it almost looks like normal intact skin, but usually, you know, it'll be obvious to you if you, if you consider it in the context of the burn. So there'll be, you'll have a patch where it's like this weird sort of dry, you know, sort of thickened seeming skin, and then you have what clearly looks like a second degree burn, and then sort of first degree beyond that. And so that, that is an example where you, that, 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 that central segment would have been uh, third degree. Third degree burns are you know, usually, I mean, by, by definition, not sensate because that's the, if it's completely burned through the skin, then you don't have the nerve endings in the skin to, uh, to, to be irritated. And so you can touch the, the burn and it often doesn't hurt, you know, and that's, that tells you, okay, this is an area of third degree. Um, you can also have a fourth degree burn. Now, this comes up and people are often like, what? You know, but that, that, that just means that the burn goes so deep that it actually has injured bone or tendon or some other deeper structure. Um, and we do occasionally see that. It's usually involved. You see that kind of injury, um, like electrical injury would be an example of that. Um, and sometimes uh, patients will get their hand caught in a machine. It's like a hot press machine. So it's, it's a combination of crush and burn, and they're stuck there, and it just, it just burns. And it just basically cooks everything. So you can get fourth degree injuries, and of course they're, they're really, really difficult to treat. So when you go into this, uh, this mode of saying, okay, I've got a burn, I'm going to de determine the percentage, you, what you're really caring about is second and third degree. So that's why I was saying it's important to be able to differentiate first degree away from it, because one of the things that often happens is people say, oh, we've got a kid with a 30% burn, they have a 2% burn and then they have 28 percent first degree, right? So nobody counts the first degree. That, that, we don't use that as part of the, the, the numbers to determine whether somebody needs to be transferred or get resuscitated or that kind of thing. So what we really care about is the second and third degree. And then, of course, there's different ways to calculate that. The, the easiest way, I think, you know, if you're just needing to get a ballpark figure of what percentage is burned here, then the Wallace Rule of Nines is an easy way to do it. That's the, the sort of the version for adults. And then you see there's sort of a rule of fives for children. And so basically these are really easy you know, things to look at. You can keep a chart just kind of handy that where you can pull it out if you ever want to look at it. And it just makes it a very easy way to sort of determine the percentage of body surface area that's burned. Um, it's not super accurate, and there's a lot of criticisms of this technique when it comes to really accurately defining in, in children and babies. But it's, it's enough to kind of give you an idea because, you know, in, in the sense of you're trying to figure out whether this person is, you know, really worthy of you know, heading to the to the hospital or not, that this you know you, you can clearly determine that if if you're you can get a, a ballpark percentage and, and then have a sense of what you need to do. Um, the the London Browder chart is it really the uh, probably the mainstay what most burn units would use to determine uh, body surface area, and it, you know it's it's just a little bit more detailed. It goes in by like each little region has its own little percentage category, and then it's based on age. And in this multiple different gradations of age, you can see at the bottom. And so that, that just gives us a more accurate percentage. And, and the reason that would matter is really for calculating the resuscitation. So what's going to happen next if you have a serious burn is that the burn unit team is going to determine how much fluid this patient needs. And you know, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that too. And another part of the assessment of the burn is going to be determining whether the patient has an inhalation injury. I have seen so many patients with a inhalation injury that is not actually an inhalation injury. And, and the reason for that is some of the misconceptions about what that means. To, to get a, an inhalation injury, you actually have to inhale the hot smoke. And so you, you, you really don't get an inhalation injury if something flashes up in your face. And so we see this a lot where somebody puts gasoline on a fire, it blows up in their face, and you know, the singes the eyebrows and nose hairs and, and the concern is inhalation injury. But you really can't get that. I mean, you'd have to inhale the smoke. You know, and so there's just not enough time in a flash type injury. So when, when people get inhalation injuries, it is generally from a closed space, right? This is a house fire, a car, the wreck, or some, some kind of space where the person is trapped and forced to breathe the hot air. You know, any person normally would simply turn away from, from hot air and not breathe it. But if you're forced to breathe it, that's what happens. And then, and then the damage is caused by a variety of mechanisms. You can get a, a heat injury component. You can get particulate matter, um, and they, these are a big part of why we think people have developed ARDS from inhalation injury. Um, and then, of course, there's also the asphyxiation element from getting uh, carbon monoxide. It's also important to realize that if you're concerned about an inhalation injury and, and you're, you're wanting to determine whether somebody might have inhaled, inhaled carbon monoxide, I'm sure you all know this, but you cannot just check the fat. 
carbon monoxide differential, it preferentially binds to the hemoglobin and will fool the fat monitor. So you have to actually test for carboxyhemoglobin. Uh, I actually read a thing. There are some, there are some probes. There are some non-invasive tests that are that are out there. I just don't know how well they work. That, that are meant to be able to determine this. But the gold standard would just be to do a carboxyhemoglobin blood test. But um, so what are some of the signs, right? So obviously, as I mentioned, one of the things you're, you have in the back of your mind is, does the mechanism of the burn fit with a potential inhalation injury? And if it does, you know, and you see singeing and burning around the airway, you know, then obviously that you're going to be concerned about that. And some of the things that you can look for to help to kind of, you know, rule out or confirm this, this suspicion would be voice changes, horses, rider, cough. These are all things, sorry for the random parentheses in there. Uh, you know, these are things that, um, you know, obviously would, would indicate that there's been damage a little bit lower down and not just kind of at the lips and mouth area. Um, slip in the sputum, uh, obviously in the nose and mouth. And when we, when we mean nose and mouth, we don't mean around the lips. We're talking about like kind of back in the mouth, I mean on the back of the tongue and areas where it really doesn't make sense that it would be from just something flashing up in your face. Um, obviously respiratory stress, confusion and agitation could be examples of not having enough oxygen in the system. Um, you know, nausea and headache, pretty nondescript symptoms really, but anything that makes you think, huh, there's something systemic going on here uh, that yeah, I'm not sure about, that, that would be increase your level of suspicion about uh, carboxyhemoglobin. You can, the next step up, if you were, you know, like this is again, this kind of gets into what the burn team might, might do, but if you were saying, oh, I think this patient had an inhalation injury, and I wanted to determine if that's true or not, or what the extent is, then, you know, obviously um, a fiber optic exam can be done. And one of the things that comes up is, you know, should these patients be intubated or not? I mean, prophylactically. And so that there, there, there was a time when it was basically thought, you know, if you suspect it, intubate them. Uh, that's been kind of moved away from because there are complications of being intubated for a prolonged period of time. And so that you see more and more uh, of trying to make that decision based on what's in front of you. So if the patient is starting to show symptoms or if you do a, a scope and you see something like this, then you say, okay, we're going we're gonna to intubate this patient and leave them intubated. Um, so you're starting to see the, the migration towards more of a clinical-based decision for that. But I think still it's fair to say that you, you don't want to get into a situation where you've waited too long, the patient's really struggling, then you go to intubate them and the airway's so swollen it's difficult to do. So that's the logic is, you know, we want to make it some, you know, somewhat based on the symptoms and the clinical picture, but we don't want to just, you know, be cavalier about it and then just not do it until it's too late because then you have a major problem. The other thing that I would like for everyone to rec recognize is the, the significance of circumferential burns. Once again, I'm not talking about a circumferential first degree burn. I'm talking about deep second, third degree burn. And the, the reason this is significant is because you can have a 2% body surface area burn, which is seemingly not a big deal, but if it's circumferential over the fingers or hand, this can actually be a big deal. And, and the reason has to do with if you get a third degree burn in the skin, that skin, as I mentioned before, kind of becomes hard, almost like a hard leather substance, and it, it actually serves as, as a constriction band. And so you can actually, as you get swelling in the soft tissues, the skin simply doesn't expand with the, the soft tissue, and you can actually get constriction of the circulation. The picture you see here is an example of where the skin has been released. Um, and we, we used to do this just at the bedside in the burn unit because the skin is numb. I mean, you can just, you can just touch the skin, the patient doesn't even feel it. Of course, they're usually in, in a situation where they're you know, sedated somewhat anyway, but, and it just pops open. And that's, um, you know, so anyway, that, that's, a, that's a big problem. And so generally speaking, you, you know, that, that's something that needs to be recognized. If you see something like that, this, this, the best example of this would be someone who's caught in a house fire or a car fire, or someone who, you know, their hand got dunked into a pot of grease. Um, that, that kind of thing, uh, that obviously needs to be evaluated right away because that can be a serious problem and it can result in the loss of limb and fingers and so forth. Um, so this kind of comes back to the question of what are you going to do? Do you, do you send the patient home? You know, how, how do you know uh, uh, when is the right time to, to treat a patient as an outpatient versus to get into the ER or, or so forth? Um, so as a general rule, less than 10% burns are you know, typically manageable as an outpatient. Now this obviously does change in PEDS because from the standpoint of dressing and wound care, you know, we're relying on parents to do the wound care and sometimes they're better than others and we're also dealing with the discomfort to the child. And so, you know, 
as I mentioned, kind of at the bottom of the list, comfort and expected level of wound care play into this. So you can have a relatively minor burn, but the patient still gets admitted because we just need to make sure they're comfortable and that the parents understand what to do, and then they can go home. Um, obviously, anybody who has an inhalation injury, you would not be sending home circumventional injury I mentioned, and concern for abuse. I'm going to talk about abuse at the end. I've got a, a, a bunch of slides about that. that we're going to spend a little extra time on that. Um, just so you know, there's a, actually the American Burn Association has criteria for referral to a burn center. This is really interesting, uh, an interesting topic to me because I, I as, as someone who largely was taking care of minor burns, I, I found, found myself dealing with this a lot when I was working down at Wake. The, the, the burn criteria were designed as a catch-all. They really were just, what they're trying to do is make sure that Nobody didn't send a patient because they didn't meet the criteria, and they also wanted to make sure you know, that there wasn't ever problems related to like these entire laws where you say, oh, I, you know, we can't take care of this patient here, and this one says, yes, you can, you know, this kind of thing. So they really tried to make it very big. And so, as you see, I mean, basically, it's, you know, anything greater than 10%, that's, that's reasonable. I mean, they're, they're, when you get to the, the higher percentages, you do start getting into the issue of resuscitation and stuff like that, and a lot of hospitals don't really want to deal with that. Um, the one that always got me was this, was this one, burns of the face, hand, feet, genitalia, major joints. I cannot tell you how many times I got a phone call about transferring a patient to the burn center because of the burn on the hand. And it would be a quarter size burn from a little grease splash. And it is not necessary to transfer the patient to the burn unit. But it meets the criteria, you know. So it's, some of that, there's just a bit of common sense that goes in with this. And this kind of plays into, I wanted to just say a few words about what sort of we think we can take care of here. You know, generally speaking, we're looking at taking care of burn, taking care of the burns that I, I would consider sort of on the outpatient side. That doesn't mean that they won't, wouldn't be admitted for a short period of time, but as a general rule, they don't, they're not to the degree of burn injury that they're requiring ICU care and resuscitation and staying in. So a lot of times they, they kind of meet the, the criteria. Anybody that meets the criteria for, for a burn center referral would largely be going away. It, the real exception comes into these burns of the hand and face and, this kind of, and, and, and some extremity and, and trunk burns too. Small percentage burns that, you know, or burns of the hand and face that aren't, you know, not circumferential hand burns, then you know, most of the things we really can deal with, you know, we can, we can admit the patients, make them comfortable, come up with a plan for the, the, the treatment of the burn that don't generally require resuscitation. Um, and so we, we would like to be called, you know, if you're ever working in the ER and, 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 and we asked you, well, you know, what, yeah, we, we would like to be called about hand and face burns in particular because many of them are small percentage and we can help determine whether or not it's something we can, we can care for or not. Um, and like the small percentage burns in general are rel rel relatively easy to care for. Um, clearly, we're going to send away uh, patients that require burn unit care. So, um, so what happens? Let's talk about the sensation a little bit. Uh, you know, so th this is something that you, you just, from a student and resident standpoint, you got to remember this because it often shows up on the test. But they have these formulas that are designed to help you determine how much fluid that you give a burn patient. Um, and you don't really start doing this kind of care until you get greater than 15% uh, total body surface area. So if something comes in with a small burn, you don't have to, to figure all this out. And there are, you know, even some circumstances where you're even getting up to 14 or 15%, but if the person is healthy and, you know, you're, you know a lot of it's really more superficial second, you, you might not necessarily initiate all of this. But, you know, the idea is that when you start getting beyond that 15% mark, your, your mortality starts going up, and under-resuscitation is one of the major reasons for that. Um, so anyway, the formula for the, the, the Parkland formula was designed uh, as kind of a general catch-all formula, um, and it's the one that's for uh, CCs per kg per percent body, body, total body surface area in 24 hours, and then you give half of it in the first eight and the other half in the, in the next 16. That's a basic formula that is generally used for adults. And so there's actually a number of variations of that that uh, have come out. There's a Shriners formula and a Cincinnati formula that are trying to sort of make this a little bit more tailored towards children. And one of the things that was recognized is that uh, you may need a bit of dextrose in there um, for, for the uh, pediatric patients. Um, and so you'll see some of the formulas are, are they include uh, the same, so this, this, this one basically is uh, the, the same base formula with the four cc's per kg per percent body surface area. Then they add in a maintenance um, of 1,500 mLs per body surface area. And it's just recognizing that, that, that pediatric patients have a higher body surface area per mass ratio. Not ratio. <laughs> so, 
the uh, and so anyway, that's the, uh, the the logic of some of these formulas. And then they, there are, some of the other things are debatable whether adding the, the sodium bicarb or the albumin is necessary. Uh, this formula does have it included. But that's the kind of thing that would happen if a patient went to the burn unit. They would calculate this body surface area. That's why they like to use that more specific London Browder chart, figure out the exact volume they want to give. Because there's actually a risk to over-resuscitation too. If you under-resuscitate them, you can actually make the burn worse. You can have organ failure. If you over-resuscitate them, you can result in pulmonary edema. So you want to get it right. And that, that's why these formulas, they try to make them as accurate as they can. The other thing that's going to happen if you go to a burn center with a, you have a lot of third degree burns or a circumferential burn is they're going to look at this escrotomy, fasciotomy thing. I talked about that earlier when I showed the other picture. This is just another example of that. Again, the problem is that skin just doesn't expand and the soft tissue is trying to swell and, and you, you're going to end up with a, an underperfused extremity. A lot of times this is happening in the same setting as a patient kind of in a little bit of shock and you're getting resuscitated and you know those patients often have poorly perfused extremities anyway and so this, this is something that needs to be recognized and dealt with right away. Um, it's also a major problem in electrical injury, which we're not really talking about in great detail, but the problem there is things get burned kind of from the inside out. And so sometimes you can have a lot of soft tissue damage um, with what looks like relatively normal skin. So that's a situation where fasciotomy is maybe necessary. Fasciotomy and fasciotomies are not the same thing. If you're doing a fasciotomy, you know, you don't necessarily make the incisions in the same way that you're doing for an escherotomy. An escherotomy is literally releasing the skin. A fasciotomy is releasing the muscular fascia, and so they do serve different purposes. You do not have to do a fasciotomy just because you're doing an escherotomy. Uh, so that they are they are they are different and serve a different purpose. Um, so let's talk about what happens next. Okay, so you you got the patient. We figured out. Okay, this patient's not going to go to the to the uh, burn unit. Perhaps maybe I'm going to treat this patient myself, or I'm deciding whether I want to send this over to Dr. Thompson. You know. We'll talk, we're going to talk a little bit about wound care, and we'll talk about some of the other things that do pertain to uh, some of the, the more in-house uh, kind of patient. Um, so I told you I'd talk about blisters. So I've got a picture of someone actually popping a blister with an unsterile needle. <laughs> that is not what you do. Right? In general, you know, there's a big debate about whether to unroof or not uh, blisters. Um, it, you know, the, the pro of it is that if you um, – if you leave the blister intact, that it protects the wound bed. It's, it's, it's a comfort measure. It's theoretically sterile, you know, uh, and so that, there's some logic to that and just leaving the blister intact. Uh, the, on, the other, on the other side, if you, you know, if you um, have a blister that is uncomfortable or that is restricting, you know, motion uh, or that perhaps, uh, it's a can harbor, it should be can harbor bacteria, it, you know, if perhaps it was actually not completely intact, then you know, you might want to consider actually just unroofing it. So that's basically how I look at it. If somebody comes in with some small blisters, I don't really worry about that. Uh, we, we, just, we, we just let those be. You know, like this blister on the finger, you know, it really could just be left alone. And in fact, I think if you see just slightly down on the finger, if I can get the mouse to show up here. This area right here is an example of what was likely a blister that went down on its own. So, you know, if you, if you just give it time, that fluid will get reabsorbed, the skin will come back, and then it will peel off in time. Um, and there's really nothing wrong with doing that. There, there's no urgency to unroofing small blisters. If I see a patient that's got big blisters, like their entire hand is blistered up, uh, it's just, it's uncomfortable that they really aren't, you know, using their hand for anything. And uh, I worry that, first of all, I know, I know they're going to rupture at some point. Like they're not going to just stay intact the entire time like maybe a little finger blister would. So I worry they're going to rupture, and then the burn wound will actually become contaminated. So a lot of times those, I will go ahead and debride the blisters away, clean away any kind of loose or you know, skin that's already fluffing, and then we can get uh, you know, a, a, a treatment right onto the burn surface. So that's kind of how I look at it. It's, it's not necessary to unroof every single blister. Um, so when you have a burn wound, you know, then the next question is like, where, the second degree, well, what are you going to treat it with? Um, a lot of times for pediatric patients, we use, we, we use bathotracin. This is particularly helpful on the face. It's just relatively easy to apply. It is soothing. Um, there is some risk of developing an allergy of bacitracin over a period of time, so we don't like to use it for more than a week. Um, but, you know, sometimes we push that a little bit. But anyway, that's the, a, a typical burn dressing for, uh, for a facial burn would just be bacitracin ointment. Um, Silvadine is kind of an interesting one. So silver sulfidizing 1%. Uh, has been the mainstay of burn treatment for decades. I mean, if you, if you look back at, to burn injury, you know, one of the things, the major problems I talked about is that you, you lose the burn, the, the intact skin surface, 
and then you have uh, exposure to bacteria. So, you know, we, we've been in decades gone by trying to figure out what would be a good product I could put on this that would kill bacteria, and silidine was one of them that did that, and it, it, it has great antibacterial properties. It, it basically gets everything pretty much but pseudomonas, and so um, it's really why you see it and they've heard about it uh, so much. Uh, there are other products like silver nitrate right out there that, and, and maffinite acetate that they, you'll see them batted around. The maffinite acetate is often talked about as it refers to treating an ear burn because it will penetrate deeper into the cartilage. Um, they're both painful to apply, so people don't like them. Uh, and silvidine largely replaced them. The downside of silvidine, which has kind of come out in the last 10 years, is that it may actually slow wound healing. And it has to do with the silver ions leaching into the burned tissue. Um, and so that there's been a lot more emphasis on looking at other alternative dressings like silver foam dressings or silver gel dressings or things where the silver doesn't leach out so much and, you know, you can still get some of the antibacterial property, still get the comfort, but maybe have faster wound healing. And there's been a number of studies that actually look at that and have demonstrated that. And then there's also biologic dressings like, you know, pig submucosal bladder, submucosa, or, you know, there's pig skin or you can get allograft skin, so that there are a number of biologic options as well. So, um, you know, generally speaking, uh, I look at silvidine as a really useful, uh, it's, 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 cheap, it's cheap and readily available. Most people can get it, you know, in their, their pharmacy, so it's super easy. For small burns, it's probably not a big deal to use silvidine because it may just be easier. Um, I like it as a transition. When, when I have a burn, I, I know we're heading towards excision of that burn, so I, we'll talk about excision in a minute, but, you know, the, uh, it, it, it's helpful for that purpose because it's, it's easy to apply, it's soothing. Uh, I'm not so much worried about the wound healing at that point because I know I'm going to excise and graft that burn. So uh, it, it may be useful for that. But if I have a burn that I'm really trying to treat to heal, um, then I think, like I said, I think the evidence is kind of moving away from silvidine to some of these other dressings. Uh, and this is just an example of like, you know, like a silver foam type dressing where, you know, you, you basically just apply it to the burn surface, just wrap it up. These dressings can often be left for three or four days at a time so that, that they're actually from a cost standpoint not that bad because you don't have to change, so you don't use so much product. Um, and um, so anyway, the, the real challenge is just getting them. Like do, do you have them available, you know, uh, in your office and, and that kind of thing. So um, anyway, that's, that's one of the things that I think is relatively new in burn care. And then of course with um, the uh, Infection, the main bacteria culprit we watch out for is Pseudomonas, which is the classic sort of smell and, and appearance. I did want to mention one other thing you may run across is, is medical honey. That's actually also a, a, a topic of interest in burn care. It's soothing, has antibacterial properties, and actually it seems to be relatively effective against Pseudomonas. And there, there are, there, you don't actually have to get honey out of the cabinet. There are actual medical products <laughs> based on honey. Um, and so there, you're seeing more and more of that kind of you know, out there. And then sometimes you just need an oral antibiotic if you get a bad pseudomonas infection. So, um, we're not going to go into a lot of this stuff, but you know, one of the things that happens when you get into patients who are admitted for high percentage burns are hypermetabolic states. They have lots of fevers and they, they burn through their calories. They have, to have, they have special calorie formulas you use for, uh, for adults and children with burn injuries. Um, we, we will, when we have a deep burn, we will often plan to excise and graft that burn. We try to do that relatively quickly. There's evidence that shows that for large surface area burns, that doing that with, within the first five to seven days actually is, is beneficial. That people used to kind of wait you know, a couple of weeks and see what would heal and what wouldn't. We generally move that up a bit. That probably doesn't really matter for small burns as much. But for larger burns, there's been evidence that demonstrates that that really makes a big difference. Um, and so that, that, that can be excision and straight to skin grafting or excision with a temporary dressing. So we have, there's a number of different burn dressings out there that, that we, we can use to kind of cover the wound and seal it while we wait to get skin. Sometimes that's because we don't have enough skin to go all at once in a really big burn. Um, obviously, uh, rehabilitation is a big part of extremity burns, particularly hand burns, just getting function back. And there's a lot of splinting and rehab and so subsequent surgeries to reduce scarring. So I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about abuse, because I know this is a topic that's going to be of great interest and, and need for you to know. Um, so this study at Parkland, they had these 5,000 pediatric burn patients, so about 5% of them were due to abuse. And I've seen these percentages kind of range from 5 to 10%. Um, generally speaking, patients who are subject to abuse are younger than the overall pediatric burn patients. We really are focusing in on kind of that, that toddler age group or uh, babies. Um, their vast majority are scald injuries. Uh, versus, so 89% of these injuries are, are scald versus 42% of the general population of, of pediatric burn. 
Um, there are some, there's some associated with contact and chemical burn, and uh, there's some particular locations that are associated with this. Um, because of this, you know, we know that we need to have a high index of suspicion. And so when, when somebody comes in, you've got to evaluate for inconsistencies and look for patterns that, that would trigger you to, to, to think about this. And so, uh, you know, the, basically the expl explanation, you know, it doesn't make sense. Uh, that what they said happened, does it make sense that that would, that would result in this burn? If there are other injuries present, that's also kind of a red flag, that there's been other abuse going on. Um, sometimes people will say, oh, my child climbed up and touched the such and such, you know. Well, if a child's, you know, a one-year-old, that's probably not what happened, right? And so you, just keeping in mind the, the compatible story with the child's age and development, um, and the reverse is also true. An older child doing something that would be really more consistent with a two-year-old uh, is, is sometimes worrisome. Um, obviously, a delay in seeking treatment. Sometimes, you know, the, the, the story where the caretaker says there were no witnesses whatsoever, not even me, you know, that's often, you know, worrisome. Uh, and then, of course, just how, how are the parents presented? Are, are they, are they, do they seem angry and resentful about the whole thing? That's also worrisome. Patterns for you to look for. Um, clean lines of demarcation are worrisome. Most accidental pediatric burns are splash injuries, and you should see gradations of burn with scattered patterns. You shouldn't see clean lines. And so that's one of the things that is um, uh, a, a worry in, in the location. And so this, this is kind of a little pictogram that kind of says, okay, well, what's an example of an accidental burn? This would be accidental pattern. So you get this, you know, the, the child pulls the hot water off the stove, it, it gets on the hand and arm and runs down onto the chest. It's asymmetric. It's upper extremity and torso, uh, and, you know, and you know, so those are the areas that are more common accidental, head and neck, upper extremity, upper torso. You also get this the splatter pattern, uh, and you get this what's called arrow signs. This is basically hot water running down, and what happens is the, the, the little num the D and I and S are basically saying, you know, here you've got a deep burn at the top where the water hit, then it's kind of intermediate, and then it's most superficial as it's run down onto the chest. This is really a classic example of a, an accidental burn. Abuse to skull burns appear differently. They often appear on the, the lower extremity, uh, buttock, groin area, lower trunk, and they often have uniform depth throughout, and they're symmetric in nature. Uh, and so th that's the pattern that, that should trigger suspicion. And then you have some examples where you've got, you know, like these clear lines of demarcation. And, you know, this, this, the top picture is a classic example of the kid put in the hot tub, you know, and you can see that line. They're held there, and that, you know, that, that, that's why you get that. You don't get the splashings. They're, they're held in place for enough time to get the burn. Sometimes you actually have a ring of normal skin on the buttocks where the butt hit the tub surface, which wasn't as hot, and that's another classic tip-off that they were just held down in that spot. The lower picture shows a foot burn, and so you have the, there's a, it's not as easily seen, but there's a line of demarcation at the ankle where the skin is normal and then, and then secondary burn with, with no like sort of gradation, and, and then the sole of the foot is actually partially spared, and it's the same kind of thing, so the foot is put into the hot, hot water, pressed against the surface of the tub, so the sole gets relatively spared against the cold surface of the tub, and everything else gets burned. So those are worrisome signs. And you get kind of the same thing with hand burns. You get the sparing effect of the palm. So if somebody, if you dunk a child's hand in hot water, they're going to make a fist. And so then you, the burn will be largely on the back of the hand. There will be a sharp line at the wrist where it was held in. And then when you open the kid's hand, some of the palm is actually spared which is not consistent with someone reaching it. If they say, oh, my kid, put their hand in the hot water. Well, if they do that, then they're going to be burned on the, on, on the palm, too. So that's a typical uh, uh, pattern to, that you should watch for. Just a little bit about contact burns, too. You know, so this is another common uh, complaint. Someone will come in and say, oh, the kid touched you know, the hot glass on the stove or the, hot, the wood fire. You know, and, so one of the things to look for is the pattern of the burn there, too, because if someone takes a child's hand and, and pushes it up against a hot surface, it's really going to burn the palm uniformly. Um, whereas if a kid comes up and touches something, you know, this, this little glass image where the kid is touching the glass plate is trying to demonstrate the difference between how, what happens when the kid just touches it on his own or when the hand is forced against it, and you see the relative sparing of the, this part of the fingers, the sort of proximal finger area. And then the central palm, this one is showing sparing of this part, but in my experience, this is a pretty common area to touch and, and get burned. But that central palm area, 
and the proximal fingers are usually spared when the kid just touches something. So this picture down here, I've seen this so many times. This is what it looks like when a kid touches something hot. Fingertips, the sort of the, 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 the thinner eminence, the, the, the um, metacarpal heads and the, at the, at the you know, end of the palm, but then sparing of the, the fingers in here and sparing of the, the central palm area. Other things to look out for would be contact burns with odd patterns and shapes, right? So um, this one up here, everybody know what this is? This is the iron, right? So it's got the little steam holes in it. The, the deeper burns are actually the areas where the steam comes out. Um, that's a classic, unfortunately. I mean, you, you, you very well may see that one. Um, this one is actually a hot spatula with the little grid marks. Um, I think this one was a, a heater. And they said, oh, the kids sat on the heater. But this is not the sitting area of the butt, right? This is not, that's worrisome. That's not the right place. And, you know, really people should be to know not to have that kind of heater around anyway. But um, these are cigarette burns, little circular burns, kind of like a little pattern. Uh, those are other things to watch out for that are very worrisome that, you know, may have some random story of something. The embers from the fire fell on the kid, but you got these, like, perfectly circular burns all, like, in a row. Um, so that, that's, um, those are all things you just have to watch out for. Um, so just a couple of words about what happens in the long term. And as I mentioned, you know, what we do. So a lot of times when, when you know, when, when we get involved, it's often after sort of the patient is healed and they come into clinic with problems related to scarring. Sometimes it's just pain. The scars are painful. Um, sometimes these scars where burns have healed uh, just don't really ever fully heal. Like they heal and then they break open and they heal again and they break open. And so in some cases we will actually just excise that healed burned skin and, and graft them because it just provides a, b a better stable coverage. Obviously the hand uh, picture there, that's a big problem. That's super hard to fix. That hand needs to be, you know, all that scar has got to be excised. The hand's got to be grafted. It probably was grafted before. You know, then it's got to, you know, you're going to go through a splinting, probably have to pin the fingers out. A lot of work can go into trying to make that hand functional. So we really try to get to not to that point, right? That, that deformity you see there is called a claw hand, and we really want to avoid that. We want to have that, you know, the, the, the ideal form of the hand is like that when they're being splinted, keeping those metacarpals bent and the fingers straight. This is the opposite, and that's a problem. It's really, once the ligaments shorten like that, it's, it's very hard to get, get it back. So um, that's one of the thing, reasons why circumferential hand burns, we, they, they really need to get cared for properly. We need, we need you know, rapid treatment if they need excision and grafting, splinting, and then the aftercare is, is sometimes pretty intense. But, um, and then you get things like this picture with the, the axilla. There's a, a burn around the upper chest, and it just created a webbing on the axilla. That's a little easier to deal with, so we, we can do a variety of Z-plasties and other sort of skin flaps to try to, like, break that up so the person can move their arm more normally. Some references. That's it. Questions? Any questions in the room? Question back here. Thank you. I um, wanted to make a comment and, and a question. I, uh, in college, studied abroad in Cape Town, South Africa, and I worked at the Red Cross War Memorial Children's, Children's Hospital there in the burn center, so your talk brought me back uh, some bad memories of being in the, yeah. the hot um, operating room or theater, as they called it, and with um, skin grafting and, and such. And the, uh, the most common cause of, um, of burn injury there was um, hot water from kettles uh, because people um, in the surrounding townships around Cape Town uh, lived in extreme poverty um, and the only way to get hot water was to heat the kettle so they would, the kids would, would pull the cords and, um, and get hot water burns. I was curious in this country uh, what is the most common mechanism as far as the, the scalding like um, microwaved um, hot water or it, it, I imagine it's not hot water from kettles but I was curious what, what the most common. Yeah the most common accidental one is if the kid pulled something off the table, like someone's got a hot cup of coffee and they pull it off, or it's something on the stove and they reach up. You know, I mean, the, you can get the scald from, like I said, just from tap water. I mean, that's a that's a problem if the hot water heater is set too hot, and you know that. You know, so we've certainly seen that. Um, the um, it's interesting you say that. We so we used to do these trips to Bolivia, and um, in some parts of the, of the world where you know it's really more sort of third world. The, the major source of heat in cooking is open fire. And so that was a big problem there, which is open fire burns, you know. And so, uh, you know, that's um, less of an issue here. Um, but. 
thank you so much for that excellent discussion on burns. I think all of us are a little uh, traumatized maybe by the, yeah. by the pictures. Um, I can remember working um, as a resident uh, going in and out of the burn unit and it, it could be very challenging. My question to you is if we're going to manage them as an outpatient for the wound care afterwards, how often should we be viewing them in the office, um, having them come back for us to view the, the healing process? Yeah, I would imagine that, I mean, you know, obviously if, if you're, if you find a patient you think probably would be a good candidate for just outpatient wound care and you're not 100% comfortable with that, just send them to me. That's fine. I, that doesn't matter to me. Um, but even minor burns, it's routine for that to happen. Um, but generally speaking, just once a week. I mean, you know, they're, they're doing their wound care at home. They can come back in a week. And this is where, again, we're talking about burns that you're really expecting just to go on to heal. Um, and so that way, if you see them in a week and it really doesn't look good, then you can send them over, you know, or something like that. Um, that's, that's, I, would, I would start with that, and that's usually what I would do is have them come back the following week, and for most minor burns, there will be significant progress in a week. You know, you, you will see, even for some intermediate partial thickness, you know, second degree burns, you will see significant area amounts of healing within one week. Uh, when you get to two weeks with really poor healing, that's a burn that probably needs to be excised and grafted, you know, so, uh, so generally the one week mark is a good time period to see them again. I'm a pharmacist, so this is a little bit different for you maybe, but when I have my learners who come through, what should I tell them about when they have customers who come into a, a drugstore asking for, you know, solar cane or something like that, at what point should they recommend that these children who have worse sunburns be seen by a PCP? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. I mean, from the standpoint of first degree burns, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I think if they get that, they probably should be seen. You know, if it's, if it's, you get big blisters, that, that's probably worth being seen. Um, but most of the time, you know, first degree burns, they generally don't blister up that, you know, like that. I mean, you, you get some small blistering, you get peeling and you know, things like that. But, you know, most first degree burns, yeah, you go through a few days of misery and then they feel better and it's, so I, that, that would be my thought is some, if you get big blisters, it's a week out and things are really still not feeling good, uh, you know, that, that, that person needs to come in and be seen to make sure that it's not infected or some other problem. Um, yeah, I mean, generally speaking, what you're talking about treating with like just soothing agents, we, we, we generally imagine those to be burns that haven't, that there, there's not a raw surface, you know, that the skin is intact. So. Okay, thank you very much, sir.